Hello, I'm Jonathan Miller. I am the general counsel for the U.S. Hemp Roundtable, the uh, hemp industry's national advocacy organization. Uh, we're proud to present today our second in a series of webinars uh, as part of our Minority Empowerment Initiative. Uh, the mission of our initiative is pretty straightforward, is to create an equitable and impactful hemp industry. We're committed to embracing the full spectrum of humanity, regardless of what we look like, where we come from, or whom we love. Uh, we have uh, uh, established a, a mission statement with with four key uh, submissions as part of that, uh, providing for an equitable industry, conscious communities, restorative justice, and equitable access. And we've held ourselves uh, to uh, as high a standard as, as possible. Uh, we, uh, we're now proud to announce that uh, more than half of our officers to the US Hemp Round Table are women and more than half are people of color. We're also uh, going through a, a very in-depth uh, survey of our member organizations to uh, determine uh, how we comply with uh, uh, diversity and, and equity and, and uh, inclusiveness in our ranks. But today is, is part of a key component of this uh, initiative, which is to promote an economic empowerment for communities of color and for minority-owned enterprises. Uh, today is an opportunity for you to hear from some experts in, in the hemp area and to ask questions uh, that uh, can help uh, uh, define and promote and improve your business. Uh, we have a, a number of uh, partners all over the hemp industry that uh, you've seen in, in part of our, our advertising, uh, but uh, our, our, our key uh, partner in this initiative is the Minority Cannabis Business Association, and I'm proud to turn over the floor to the executive director of that organization, who also serves as an officer of the U.S. Hemp Roundtable, Amber Littlejohn. Amber, floor is yours. Thank you, Jonathan, and a special thank you to the Roundtable, um, both for putting together the Minority Empowerment Committee and for this event today. Um, I will say that I am frequently impressed uh, by the commitment that I've seen from the Roundtable in this work and how aggressive the Roundtable has been in acting and delivering as opposed to just talking about it. Um, the first big example of that was the first of these minority empowerment webinars that we did back at the end of last year. There were so many questions and so much interest and so much of that focused around compliance that we wanted to get back together and bring in some new experts to talk about compliance. For small minority businesses and truly all small businesses in a highly regulated technical compliance heavy industry, the technical compliance aspect can be not only a barrier to entry, but a barrier to being able to sustain and to thrive as a business. And so we are really committed both at the Minority Cannabis Business Association and at the US Hemp Roundtable to really uh, looking at those barriers to entry and sustainability and figuring out ways to provide tools and resources so that we can ensure that we are creating a diverse hemp industry, both from the perspective of the size of businesses as well as the demographics of those businesses. So with that, I want to welcome you to navigating regulations in the hemp industry. And I have the honor of inter introducing our panel. Uh, first up, I will go in the order that I see you, uh, Marielle. I will just add before I turn it over, Marielle and I have the honor of serving together at the US Hemp Authority, which is the standard setting organization for the hemp industry. Um, and she is brilliant. And I, again, am looking at two experts on this panel that are among the folks that I, I really would be who I would turn to for these issues. So um, here we go. Thank you very much, Amber. Um, I'm glad to be back here. Um, my name is Marielle Weintraub. I'm president of the U.S. Hemp Authority. It's a certification program that was developed um, to increase confidence in hemp products for both consumers and uh, regulatory groups. Um, my, I started in hemp by accident in 2016 when I found it, uh, when I was more on the testing side of dietary supplements and realized the need for standardization and uh, fit for purpose testing for products in this space. Uh, I helped build the testing program at what was Covance, now Europeans for hemp products. 
and continue to concentrate on methods and standards in this industry. As a side note, I also happen to work in the hemp industry because the U.S. Hemp Authority uh, president position is volunteer. Um, so I'm the director of scientific research and development at a large hemp company in Texas. Tanya. Hello, everyone. My name is Tanya Lewis. I am the co-founder of Misachi. We are a vertically integrated hemp company based in Nashville, Tennessee that was founded in 2019 with the goal of producing high quality hemp products with a fully traceable supply chain. Uh, the company was, you know, I started in the hemp, my hemp journey in 2018 after going to the Southern Hemp Expo and recognizing that there was a lack of minority participation in this industry. And uh, after meeting my co-founder, Mark Montgomery, we, we both had a, a the same vision around this plant and that it is, there's a multitude of uses for hemp beyond just the oil. And so the goal of the company is to start with the, with, you know, with the flower, but ultimately to, to, to incorporate the, you know, looking at products that we can develop from the root as well. So um, from the tip of the flower to the root of the plant is, is our, is our model as a company. And I'm excited to be here today. Yeah. And Anthony. Hello, and thanks for the invitation. My name is Anthony Newby. I'm the co-founder of Cultivated CBD, and we're based in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, we manufacture about 50 different SKUs and distribute to about 600 retail stores in, in our neck of the woods. And like many of you, uh, we're navigating not just a business um, and trying to scale and, and be successful uh, in the industry, but uh, we happen to be located just a few blocks from where the Derek Chauvin uh, trial happened and the verdict will be read, uh, the sentencing guidelines for later this week. And so we've had to get our mostly black and minority staff in and out of the, the building with tanks and Humvees and National Guard and, and all the rest of it. Um, so like many of you, we're navigating not just the, the business aspect of things, but, um, you know, all the, the rest of the cultural uh, things that are happening in the country as well. So I, I'm happy to be here and add my perspective. Thank you, Anthony. Far too often, uh, the management of all of the other things when it comes to being a small uh, and minority owned business uh, are not discussed. So I definitely appreciate that added perspective. Last but absolutely not least, one of the most brilliant compliance minds I know, Rend. Thanks, Amber. Uh, I'm Rend Almondri. I'm a partner with the law firm Amin Talati Wasserman. Um, I'm in our DC office and our firm focuses on providing regulatory compliance uh, and legal advice to uh, mainly the dietary supplement, food, cosmetic, um, over-the-counter medicine and medical device industries. And I lead our hemp and CBD practice group. Um, and a lot of my time is spent helping um, our clients in the hemp and CBD space understand the ever-changing requirements for hemp and CBD products at the state level, as well as um, you know, tracking what's going on at the federal level, you know, waiting for what's next from the Food and Drug Administration, the Federal Trade Commission, and the other uh, federal agencies that uh, regulate these products. Thank you for that, Rend. Uh, since I have you, let's jump right in. Uh, again, many of these questions will be shaped around the questions that those of you who were here last time had, and really what experts and those uh, and folks that are operating in this space are, are seeing as compliance challenges. So let us just jump in. Uh, so if I just decided today that I wanted to get up and start a hemp company, mm -hmm. Would it be legal for me to grow, manufacture, sell a hemp or CBD product anywhere in the country that I wanted to do so today? Well, um, we're gonna break that down into the various steps that you mentioned. So you uh, would need a license to grow hemp. And that would be a license. Um, and this is a requirement under the 2018 Farm Bill, um, which set up the, the framework um, under which hemp can be grown. And it sets up a system by which either states, um, after having their hemp plan uh, approved by USDA, could issue licenses, or USDA itself um, could issue a license in order to grow hemp. So that, that's required um, on the growing side. Now, where it gets a little complicated and, and a little bit more gray is on the, 
the processing side and extracting side. So the 2018 Farm Bill did not cover any requirements for extracting, really. I mean, so that is, is basically a, a state by state. Um, some states have requirements for extractors and, and, and processors. And, and by that, I'm just talking about, you know, you have your, your hemp is grown, you have the biomass, and now you want to create an extract or something out of it. Um, and that's not really, um, you know, addressed in, in federal law, just that process of, of extracting. Now, if you want to create an ingredient that's going to go into a food or a dietary supplement, then you're going to have to turn to um, FDA's laws and regulations um, around good manufacturing practices. Um, your facility would need to be registered as a food facility with, with FDA. And that includes dietary supplements because dietary supplements are considered a category of food. So pretty much all the requirements like you know, food safety, um, there's some exceptions would apply to supplements as well. And I think that's often overlooked, but it's important to, to understand that always treat supp dietary supplements like food. Uh, for cosmetics, uh, you know, topical products, things like that, uh, the, 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 the rules are different. So it really will depend um, on what type of product you're talking about. Um, and, um, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, states, some states do have requirements for manufacturing ingredients and for manufacturing final products as well. And so the manufacturer of final products too is regulated by, by FDA. Again, depends on whether we're talking about a food or a supplement or a topical product. Um, and so navigating the, the states is important there too. And finally, you know, whether you can sell a product, um, that is also um, in part determined um, by the specific product we're talking about. Um, some states will have different requirements for topical products versus food and supplements. Um, and you know, at the federal level, um, you know, we you have to navigate around FDA's position that CBD cannot be sold as a food or a dietary supplement. Those restrictions don't apply to uh, a topical products. But there really is um, it, it really I think most of this because at the, at the federal level, I think things are still evolving. It's, it's really important to um, take a look at the states and, and wh where you're selling the products and whether there are specific requirements like registration um, of the company or the retailer or the product itself, like in states like Utah, uh, West Virginia, Iowa are a couple where um, if you're not registered and, and regulators in, in inspect, they will notify you um, of that registration requirement. I'm sweating, like my palms are sweating just having gone through that. So I apologize to all of you listening to that. Um, I've been in this for years and it still uh, is stunning to me. Uh, Anthony, did you want to jump or Marielle, did you want to jump in there? Yeah, this is Anthony. So, you know, that was very well said and it's, it's a complicated uh, kind of stew that we all live in. Uh, one thing that I'll add is, you, you know, this was especially true early on in the development of, of our business where we would get into stores and almost daily we get a call from a retailer saying, the sky is falling, we're going to be raided tomorrow. Uh, I've heard you can't have gummies in the shape of a this or that, or I've heard they're going to ban this or that flavored product. And we pretty quickly realized we need to to both track and advise folks that if it's not a statute, if it's not expressly written and codified into a law that is shareable and you can look it up and it's public, um, then let's disregard the sort of white noise of all of the various rumors and personal um, anecdotal ideas about which way the market is gonna go. So I'll just maybe add that, that piece that, um, you know, tracking statutes, uh, and law, whether it's local, state, or federal, is really important and sort of having the discipline to, to not be distracted by all of the various um, rumors that are popping up uh, all the time in the industry. I will be leaning on you in the next section to talk a little bit more about how you do that. Marielle, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I, I think it's really important to know who your partners are. Um, so let's say you're not a grower, you're not a manufacturer, you want to be a brand owner. So you wanna find people to work with. Um, it's important that you keep track of these regulations. You know what to expect of your partners, of your co-manufacturers, even of the people just, let's say, storing your product or boxing your product for you. There are regulations when it comes to food and dietary supplement and cosmetics for all of that. 
you want to make sure that these groups are paying attention to both federal and state rules. Um, so don't, you can definitely trust your partners. Um, you still need to verify what your partners are doing. And Amber, I just want to jump in because I, I really think Marielle made an important point. Um, and it, it's something that we always remind our clients about is that, you know, if you are you know, working with partners, make sure they're qualified to do what they're doing. Um, and, and one fundamental rule with FDA is, is you cannot contract away your responsibility. So even if you're having someone doing packing or, or you know, you know, co-manufacturing, which is very, very typical, um, not all companies are, are vertically integrated where they're doing everything, you know, growing the hemp, you know, making the products, whatever it is, labeling the products. I mean, all of these, you know, you can, you can delegate those responsibilities to, to other entities, but it really comes down to if you're the brand owner, FDA is going to hold you responsible for ensuring that GMPs are being followed. Um, you need to be able to have access to those records and any manufacturer who's saying, you know, we're not going to share with you specifications, things like that. That's a big red flag. So um, just you, you as the, the, the brand owner are just as responsible uh, for compliance as everyone else in the supply chain. Yeah, I'm gonna, uh, this is again, getting into our next section, but I feel like I, I wanna just put an exclamation point on this. Please reach out to the people on this panel, reach out to the US Hemp Brown Table, reach out to the US Hemp Authority, reach out to the Minority Cannabis Business Association. If you have any questions about finding a reputable you know, reputable folks. And we're going to talk a little bit about how you find that reputable team, but please don't just assume that because somebody came to you and they say that they do what you need, uh, that they are going to do that well and in a way that's going to keep you out of trouble. So let's go a little bit into the, the big one when it comes to uh, hemp. USDA, can you cover, can you just give us a little bit of a, an overview, Marielle, of what USDA compliance looks like for a small uh, for a small CBD company or hemp company? Sure. Um, where you're going to be mostly concerned uh, with USDA regulations and compliance is if you are a grower, um, needing someone who is licensed to grow, want to grow, um, that's really where you're going to pay the most attention to uh, USDA regulations. Uh, they're the ones who are going to be able to license or the state will license, but through approval of USDA. Um, and if you are a grower, you want to pay, pay attention to USDA's final rules for hemp. Um, they very clearly call out testing necessities. They very clearly call out who you can and cannot test with, which methods you should be using, what you need to test for. Um, but then in addition to USDA, you want to pay attention to your state regulations when it comes to growing and farming, because the, what matters there when you're a farmer or a grower is whether or not you're going to be able to sell your harvest. And so even though you're a grower, you still want to check, uh, let's say the state rules for finished products, because let's say you have a high level of a heavy metal like lead in your soil. Your biomass, your harvest is going to be very hard to sell to someone who's making a finished uh, dietary supplement product because we have to stay below certain levels when it comes to heavy metals. So paying attention to your state rules, but also USDA's rules, why you're growing, what you're growing for, and who you plan to sell to are all going to come into play on your decision. That is, uh, I'm going to again, jump off script a little bit, because one of the biggest questions and concerns that I hear from small operators is the ability to sell product. And generally speaking, what are the biggest compliance issues that are keeping, I know that there are multiple factors that are limiting the ability to sell either, you know, biomass or finished product, you know, processed ingredients. Um, what are the biggest compliance issues that are you, that are happening that are keeping people from being able to sell either the biomass or finished products or even ingredients. Um, is that directed back at me? I will, I will direct it back at you and then open it up to the panel because again, that's a question I think we get really frequently. So if we want to be very honest and open in this forum, there is still an abundance of CBD on the market back from 2018, 2019. Um, so that's going to be a decent size barrier, except for the fact that people now have kind of moved past just CBD 
and are looking for other cannabinoids that they can then create products with. So if you're able to grow those uh, cultivars or chemovars uh, that people are looking for, um, it might give you a different edge than if you're just selling for CBD. There's a reason the price per CBD percentage has dropped so much and it's a supply and demand issue, um, but that doesn't mean the demand isn't there. What people are looking for to create products is something that's innovative. So we as brand owners are constantly innovating. And so you almost want to know where we're gonna be in a year and grow for that versus trying to grow for, for catching up for the last year. Either Anthony or Tanya, did you have perspective from your side? I was just gonna say that, you know, in terms of compliance, um, as it relates to the hemp industry as a whole, when it comes to growing hemp, I think you said that earlier, Marielle, a lot of times, uh, you know, people that we encounter that are growing hemp, you know, may not necessarily know like the protocols for being able to grow it successfully because maybe this is their first harvest, maybe they're just trying this crop out. And so they don't know to do things like, you know, get their soil tested and, and, and you know, read those results and to know if it tests high in metals, then that is what's going to come out in their crop. And so to bring a product to us, you know, as, as processors, and for us to turn around and say, hey, we can't buy this from you because it, it tests too high. A lot of times, you know, that that is a barrier of entry. And so really educating people and informing them about how, what are the best practices? What should you be doing to remediate those things at the front end so that you don't get to a place, you know, where you're not able to sell this crop that you spent so much money on, or when it comes to even, you know, uh, the way people are marketing or the way that they're, uh, you know, presenting uh, products that we're putting onto the market, it is, uh, it's a challenge in that, you know, you have to educate them again about state by state. What does your state require you to do to, for your labels? What are you, what, what, what are you permitted to say on your, you know, in, in your marketing material? How do you present that information to your consumer so they're educated about what it is you're trying to sell? There's a, an abundance of products on the market and it's hard for a lot of consumers to sift through well, what's the best product, what's not the best product. And so as a brand, you gotta think about differentiation. How do you set yourself apart? What are you doing to mitigate some of the problems or challenges that may come up from a regulatory standpoint? And how do you stay informed about what those regulations are so that you're not hit on the back end of those things? So, um, you know, just, and as an extractor, we're in a state where there is no re regulation around extraction or processing. So our company has decided to, you know, quality is ab above all thing, everything else. And so we decided to look at other industries that are succeeding, like the American Herbal Products Association, and, and, and model what they're doing, you know, and that's, you know, something that I would, you know, for people that are getting involved in this industry, look at what other industries are doing, and how they're doing it, and how they're succeeding at it. I think you bring up a really important point is that we, you know, this, we are new, uh, but dietary supplements are not new, herbal products are not new, cosmetics are not new, uh, and so many of the categories in which we will be operating are not new, and there are standards that exist for processing, testing, quality, manufacturing, all of those things, so I definitely, that is an extraordinary point. Anyone else before I start picking on Rin about FDA? Alrighty. Just, yeah, please, please, Anthony. Amber, I'll just add really quickly that um, for us, this isn't necessarily advice, but for us, we found success by reaching out to elected state agencies and, and related staffers and really treating them like um, collaborators. And, and it was sort of a risk for us to say, we wanna be a high road employer. And um, we found with the city of Minneapolis, for example, we took that risk and did it and found we were the only brand that this was a year and a half, two years ago. They knew that all these products were on the shelf, but nobody was engaging them directly. And they were really happy to have uh, a collaborator that they could work through together these issues because we have to all remember that the industry is new to everybody, not just the, the brands, but the regulators as well are, are trying to deal with this. And, and oftentimes finding a partner on the brand side and the business side is actually really useful to those folks and, and useful to us as well. 
And Rick, can I add to that just quickly? Absolutely, please. That is really important because one of the things that we as a company did not do at the outset of really developing this company was reach out to our state department of agriculture. I can't tell people how essential it is to work with your state officials who are regulating this industry to not only become informed about the industry, but to also help them sort of bridge the gaps that are lacking in the industry to, to because everybody, like you said, is learning and, and not everybody has the right answer. We're all still trying to build the machine or fly the plane as we're flying it. And so, you, you know, strategic partnerships and alignment with state and government agencies that are re responsible for regulating this, I think is, is pertinent to the growth. Thank you both for that. I, you raised tremendous points. Rend, so moving over to FDA where things get even more complicated. Mm -hmm. um, and But this is also the place that I think is so challenging for small businesses to navigate um, that it presents risk that keeps people from entering and then it presents challenges that get people out of it. Um, so can you talk a little bit about FDA and some of the high level things that, that FDA both does and, and what to, to watch for there. Sure, so I think an easy way to think about it is that you know FDA regulates the production of products, how they're manufactured. I mentioned you know, things like you know, good manufacturing practices um, and also the contents of the products, you know, the, the ingredients um, and then the safety of that, that final product and its ingredients, including um, things like adverse event reporting and record keeping, which are mandatory for dietary supplements um, and for over-the-counter medicine products. Um, and I think also very importantly, what claims you can make for the product. And that will depend on, on the type of product. Um, for example, I mentioned you know, FDA's position um, is that CBD isn't legal for food and dietary supplements, but really, it looks like you know claims seem to be the biggest risk factor in terms of you know will a company get an FDA warning letter. So um, avoiding disease claims, implied disease claims, um, and sticking with what claims are allowed for dietary supplements um, or food for that matter will will help reduce risk. Um, but I think also safety is just as important, and and I and I don't know that there's enough conversations about safety. Um, obviously, FDA has concerns about the safety of CBD, um, and that's why its position on, on, on CBD is, is, is the way it is. Um, but there is uh, this in, inherent um, requirement within the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act that any product you put out there needs to be safe. And I th the, the term they use is adulteration. So you have an obligation as a company not to sell any product or ingredient that is unsafe. Um, so those are the, I think, you know, claims and, and, and safety are, are two really big things to, to think about um, in, in terms of FDA compliance. And, and just really quickly on the topic of, of claims, um, another important federal agency to, to think about is the Federal Trade Commission. And just briefly, they set the standards for substantiation or, you know, what level is required to back up your claims. Because any claim that you make, you're responsible for ensuring that it's truthful and not misleading. Um, and it can get kind of complicated, you know, what's misleading and what's deceptive. Um, but, you know, for the most part, I mean, if, you, if you're even, you know, thinking about a, a, a claim and in terms of the science that's out there on CBD, so far it's pr pretty limited. And if you look at FTC's website, and I would encourage you to do that, they, uh, there was an initiative called CB, CBDC or CB Deceit. And they basically talk about, you know, what type of claims they're looking for in terms of enforcement. And FTC is a law enforcement agency, um, so they have a, a lot more um, enforcement power than FDA in terms of, you know, they can issue fines and monetary penalties. But really, I mean, they know that the science is limited on, on CBD. So if you're making claims that would exceed the science, um, you know, and, and, and even you know, the ones like, you know, curing cancer, preventing cancer, I think that's pretty obvious to stay away from. But even if you're um, talking about the science on, you know, CBD and, and stress or sleep, you really need to be careful to make sure that that science is, is based on a product that's similar to yours. Um, you know, oftentimes I see um, someone, you know, they, they've read a, um, a study on, um, you know, marijuana um, and smoking marijuana, 
and try to use a study like that to back up a claim for a CBD product. Um, and so that's just, that's the kind of thing that regulators look at. It's just not a good match for the claim that you're making. So um, yeah, it's just, it's just important to, to know that the claim that you're making is actually supported by science. Muriel, I saw you come off mute. I, I wanted to ask you a follow-up question because this is such a big issue and it breaks my heart because people, this is where folks run afoul so frequently. This is what FDA is like, hey, FDA over here, come look at me. Um, so I wanted to ask about something that Ren just said, and that is making sure that the science you're looking at actually connects to your product. And do you have any, in addition to what you were going to add, can you um, give any kind of advice in terms of what to look for when translating uh, a study into your product and, and its value uh, with your product in terms of being able to, to make a claim about that? Sure. Um, so uh, my, my first advice is to not make claims. Um, because the ability to actually substantiate claims is very, 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 very difficult. Um, even if it's just a supports a healthy sleep cycle is actually a very hard claim to substantiate because you need to not, so like, let's say we're talking about a capsule and in that capsule, you not only have CBD, let's say you have melatonin. You can't just use the melatonin research for supporting your healthy cycle, like your sleep cycle. You need to find research that a sleep cycle was supported when it was a combination of CBD and melatonin. Then you have to take it a step farther and find a study with CBD and melatonin where the melatonin was similar to the milligrams in your product. Um, and the CBD needs to be similar to, product, to the milligrams in your product. And hopefully everyone is making very new and very different products. And therefore, you have a very hard time substantiating claims like that. So although everyone wants to make claims and they want to shout them from the, the rooftops, the safest way and the way to stay off FDA and FTC's radar is to follow manufacturing practices, label correctly, and stay away from claims. And by the way, claims can be found in your blogs, in your tweets, on LinkedIn, there was a letter recently that FDA, a warning letter FDA sent out, and it was a post, I believe, in LinkedIn or on Facebook that was called out in this FDA letter. Um, and the easiest way to learn what not to do is to read other people's warning letters. Uh, so I would advise you to go to the FDA website and pull all the warning letters you can. You will see that what FDA calls out is repeat. It almost looks like Mad Libs fill in the blank from letter to letter to letter to letter. So you can pretty easily figure out what not to do, uh, unfortunately, based on letters that other groups have gotten. Anthony, thank you, Marielle. Anthony, did you have, uh, I see you off mute. Uh, so nothing to add in terms of um, federal agencies and, and what they're looking for. And we agree with, with most of that as a, as a local brand. Um, the couple things that I'd maybe add to is as a brand, um, uh, we do point to science, you know, the, the science is limited, uh, but when people ask a question on social media, for example, um, you know, we'll point to existing science, which is emerging more and more all the time. And uh, of course we try to be thoughtful about um, where that science is coming from and what is the source and, and so on. But there is more and more science that's emerging and, and we feel like it's important to direct people to, to credible sources. We don't say it ourselves, but we'll say, here's a link and you can do some more research on your own. Um, and the last thing I'll say is, you know, we, we also think it's important, you know, this is a, a plant and related products that have been used for thousands of years. And so there are certainly uh, benefits that people are experiencing and sort of testimonials of other people who are, or maybe your consumers who are using the product. Um, uh, as far as we're concerned, folks have every right to, to sort of voice uh, their own personal experience. But as a brand, we try to be very thoughtful and disciplined about certainly packaging, labeling, uh, but also website, social media. We don't make the claims, um, but we certainly encourage others to, to state their personal experience. All right, Ren. 
I, chime in. I, I was, I was, I was teeing right back up to you. So I will just be quiet since I knew it was coming. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I just want to just add a word of caution with, with testimonials um, and, and product reviews, um, which I view as different. I mean, testimonials are um, often where you, you know, you highlight like on your website, for example, you highlight uh, a, a customer's experience with your product. Like I tried this product and um, it, it helped me sleep within five minutes. So even if that testimonial is truthful, like this is, you haven't edited anything this person said, if it's not representative of what most consumers would expect when using your product, then you might need to add a disclosure or a disclaimer that explains what the typical results would be. Um, so another way to think of it is if that testimonial isn't supported, you know, by the underlying substantiation that's out there on you know, CBD and sleep, for example, um, you know, you, you couldn't in F FTC's view, just put that testimonial out there and, and, and just leave it there. You know, FTC would expect you to explain, you know, whether those you know, results are, are typical or not. With product reviews, um, you know, if you're just allowing customers to go on there and give a five-star review and you're not giving them any incentive, you're not giving them free products or discounts or anything to do that, um, you know, for the most part, you can, you, you know, you can just leave those there. Um, if you have some standard rules around, you know, not making disease claims or, you um, you know, not having anything profane or, or, or something derogatory on there, you know, that, that that's fine. But um, it, it is important to um, have a, a system in place specifically for, for, for testimonials um, to make sure that, you know, you're not making a, a claim through a testimonial that, that wouldn't be supported by, by scientific evidence. One last little follow-up to make sure that we have a uh, third-party literature. Can you just sure tips for navigate uh, an explanation of what that is and tips for navigating the use of, of third-party literature? Yeah, I mean there there is under the uh, the laws with respect to dietary supplements specifically an exception for for third-party literature that was that was included as part of the law that was passed in 1994. So. Um, it, it, there, there is an exception for, for that, meaning that if you have um, truly educational materials, which have nothing to do with your product at all, unbranded, um, just very um, uh, uh, basically unbiased um, scientific information about the benefits of, you know, let's use the example of, of, of CBD again, um, not talking about any proprietary ingredient or any specific product, um, you know, there, 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 there is an exception for that. However, if you are posting scientific studies on your website, for example, as references, um, and those scientific studies mention disease claims, and it's on, for example, a blog or um, a description of your product on the website, FDA would consider those to be implied disease claims because basically you are um, you know, sending consumers to information um, that discusses you know, the use of CBD or, or hemp extract, whatever it is, in the context of you know, preventing, curing, mitigating disease. Um, and because it's part of a you know, branded website and connected with the sale of your products, it's on your e-commerce website, for example, then FDA would, would say that um, that's basically the same as, as making a claim for your product. So you really need to be careful with those scientific references. FDA has issued warning letters to companies that have used scientific references, for example, on their, on their e-commerce site. And again, even if it's truthful um, information about you know, CBD and the science behind it, it, it becomes a claim for your product once you are putting it on your e-commerce site or, or some other marketing material that, that's being used to sell your product. So uh, a good takeaway from all of that is going to lead us into our, our section coming up after the next question, which is putting together a compliance team, because I think the biggest piece of advice that any of us on this panel would give is to find compliance support, um, because that 
as you uh, saw, is a, a challenging thing to navigate if you are going to step in the place of, of making, providing third party information or making claims. Before we pivot into to some kind of what it takes to put together this compliance team, let me, uh, of, are there any big challenges that have not been covered that you see um, both as a service provider or an operator? And so Tanya, let me start with you. I think really when we talk about education in this in this space, you know, as a as a extraction company, as a processor, we are always having to educate our consumers about what is quality. And when they come to us, it's like, you know, we have people that are steeped in the industry who have a lot of experience or as as much experience as one can have with such a new industry. And then we have people that are completely brand new to the industry that don't necessarily know what they should be looking for. And so when I introduce the idea of quality to, to them, or we talk about quality, I have to really walk them through the process of what that looks like. And for us, it's being a fully traceable company, meaning that all the raw material that come into our company is thoroughly vetted, that we have documentation on all testing that has happened with that product, all the way through to the finished product. And we test it throughout the entire process from the flour to the oil. And so when people, people hear that they're like, wow, well, why does that make a difference? Because again, in an early, you know, in this nascent industry, it is pertinent that everyone do if they can to really make sure that we're putting our best foot forward. And that means that we hold each other accountable and that we, we, we are set out to do the best that we possibly can to ensure the safety and the efficacy of the products that we're putting into the market. So it's, it's really a challenge when you come to people who are, you know, um, who just want a quick, easy product to put on the shelf and to put a label on it. It's really like that, we, we, don't, we don't service those kind of people and we're not willing to compromise on that. And so it's, it's, it's hard when you're a boutique company that's starting out to, to come up against some of these giants in the industry who have a lot of capital that can lower their cost or their minimum, or you know have these certain minimum order quantities that you can't necessarily match. And so, it's, it's, you know, it's sort of this dance of like really continuing to maintain quality and excellence in, in what we do as a company and not compromise on that, as well as educating everyone through in the, in the industry about the importance of that and, and having that be the ultimate value that we all uphold at, as industry leaders, because that's in the end, we're, we're, we're trying to protect people's health and their well being. People are consuming this product because they want to feel better, you know, and they want to live better lives. And if we are not doing our due diligence to ensure that that's happening, then we've done a great disservice. So I, you know, I think that's the biggest challenge is education, maintaining quality and making sure that people understand that. And, um, you know, just continuing to be, you know, just, uh, uh, just, you know, transform the, the landscape as it unfolds and continue to deal with the regulations that come down the pike and, and staying informed about those things. Um, so it's just, uh, you know, doing our best that we possibly can do. <laughs> so thank you, Tanya. Let's move into some, just some practical, uh, some practical perspective. What would be your, and Anthony, I will start with you. What would be your recommendation when it comes to putting together a compliance team? Uh, because again, companies, you know, especially small businesses don't necessarily have the opportunity to have departments and big giant compliance staff. So for a small micro just starting out business, what would you recommend in terms of putting together a compliance team? Yeah, I'd say first and foremost that, you know, you, you as an owner or, or operator of a small business, sort of always reminding yourself that the buck stops with you and you need to, um, you know, take it as seriously as anybody in the company and not sort of um, look to immediately outsource it to somebody else, even though it may not be the, the most fun or sexiest part of running your business. Um, you know, really take it seriously and take the time and write it into your schedule and, and be disciplined about it. The second thing is um, there are many, many people in every state that want to be involved in the industry. And you as an operator, even if it's a very small business or a startup, are attractive to folks who maybe are experienced uh, in law or accounting, et cetera. And so you have some leverage and you have some ability to 
to control pricing and hourly rates and so on, because you're actually offering an on-ramp into an emerging industry and they're going to learn along with you. So don't forget that power and, and leverage that you have there. And lastly, in almost every city and state, there are um, organizations that are tasked with technical support of small businesses and minority owned businesses. And there's a local Minnesota business called MEDA and there are many others like it, M-E-D-A. And that's, uh, it offers technical support when it comes to legal accounting and many other services, uh, sometimes for free or at a discounted rate. And at the very least, we'll connect you to folks in their network. And most cities and states have this. And don't be afraid to use that and leverage it. None of us can really succeed in this industry on an island, at least in my experience. And oftentimes the most successful operators are ones that are very deliberately collaborative and are looking for partnerships and, and to expand their relationships um, and to expand their field of support. So those things exist almost everywhere. And I would encourage folks to, to be disciplined and really look for those resources um, in your area. And then so Marielle. Um, I just want to remind everyone, I know it's, it's probably a bit of a barrier uh, when you're first starting up. Um, but a lot of times quality departments or just quality people and a compliance person get overlooked. Um, money gets put to operations, it gets put to product, it gets put to marketing. Um, and really a lot of times, and unfortunately the quality department or a, or a compliance person is ignored until that company is in trouble. And you don't want to be that group because that can get you shut down immediately and it won't be worth it in the end. Um, there are a lot of people out there who are not well-versed in hemp quality. Uh, we are a fairly new industry, but there are a lot of people out there who have a lot of uh, history in the dietary supplement industry or the food industry and hiring someone to a lower quality position to help support you as you grow your compliance group or as you grow your quality group. Aim for someone with history in food or dietary supplements if you can't find hemp. Um, and at the same time, you can also hire uh, people to come in and do a gap analysis. Tell you what you're missing, tell you what you don't know because you don't know it. Um, it's a one-time fee. You can find people who do it. You do wanna make sure that those people are qualified um, if you bring them in as a contractor to do a gap, all, gap audit for you. Um, and I think that might be a good place to start if you don't know what you don't know at that point before you start hiring. I, Amber, I'd just like to add, I mean, when we talk about accessing free resources, tap into your local trade organizations or even some of these national organizations to stay informed about what's happening at the federal and the state levels. And you know, also your Metro Health Department, especially if there's certain uh, ways that they require that you label products, that you, um, that you package products. I mean, those are, you can, you can just schedule an appointment and show up at those places to be able to do that. So you don't always have to have a compliance team in order to get the information you need to make sure that you're doing business the right way. Um, the one thing I did fail to mention, and being president of the U.S. Hemp Authority, I might want to mention it, um, is on our website, our guidance and our standard is free. Um, you can download it. Uh, you can read it. It may give you a step up on, on at least what to go look for or what federal documents you need to find or what testing documents you need to find, uh, what we don't allow if you want to be U.S. Hemp Authority certified. Um, and you may be able to turn that into almost a checklist. Um, just to start with. I warn you now, it will not cover everything, um, but it may be a good place to start. It's free, it's online, and you can also see the other companies that are U.S. Hemp Authority certified. Um, some of those are uh, co-manufacturers, private labelers, um, if you want an idea of where to start. Thank you, Marielle. Alrighty, uh, we are getting close and we want to be able to have some time for questions. So let me go ahead and uh, I'm gonna jump off screen and then I'm gonna start with a few questions. Uh, let us see, 
Uh, Muriel, I am going to start with you. And that is, uh, what is the difference, uh, what difference is there for selling smokable hemp as opposed to more processed CBD oil when it comes to testing? Um, sure. So I am a scientist and I'm about to let my geek flag fly for a second. Some of you guys may have heard the term or may have heard the saying, the solution to pollution is dilution. That is incredibly untrue when it comes to pesticides and heavy metals in finished hemp products. Um, so when we're talking about smokable hemp, it's a little different only because you want to make sure, first of all, you're growing in a state that allows you to grow uh, smokable hemp and you're selling it to groups who are allowed to buy smokable hemp, what you're going to end up there is realizing that you're not going to take this and process it further. So you do want to make sure it's being stored correctly. You want to make sure you're testing for mycotoxins and other fungi that may or may not be growing on your smokable hemp. Things that you may not have to worry about, although you still have to test for it, things that you may not have to worry about if someone is buying your hemp to process it down to a CBD isolate. Um, you have to pay attention to the current um, pesticide levels, the current heavy metal levels. That's not different if you're selling it to someone who's going to process it further. Um, and you also want to pay attention to your, and this goes for everyone, your Delta 9 levels and your THCA levels, and now also your Delta 8 levels, depending on which state you are in. There really isn't a lot of difference when it comes to testing your finished product, whether it's a CBD isolate or if it is for uh, smokable hemp, the difference is going to come from your growing, um, the soil it's growing in. Um, remember that hemp is a phytoremediator. It will pull up anything in the ground that's growing around it. It's excellent for the earth. It's not great if you're going to turn it into a consumable. Um, and so paying attention to that is very important. And then understanding the regulations are important, but really when it comes to testing, most of the states want you to test a series of methods, heavy metals, pesticides, residual solvents, mycotoxins, micro cannabinoids, regardless of what that product is, if it's a finished product. So you're going to end up having to test the same, uh, same tests. Um, regardless of what it's what it's turning into, it just may be a little more lenient if you are going to process it down to an isolate, but not when it comes to heavy metals and pesticides. Wonderful. Thank you, Marielle. So my next question, let me go ahead and direct this to Rend. Rend, when you are when if clin if using clinically tested ingredients in a formulation, can CBD listed be listed as an inactive ingredient? Hmm. Well, I mean, I what? <laughs> so inactive and active ingredients are terms that are used for drug products. So um, if we're talking about, and I and I don't think that whether it's clinically tested or not will not determine whether it goes into a drug product or a dietary supplement, for example. So I think, you know, saying something is, uh, or, or the fact that something is clinically tested, while it, 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 it's a good thing, it is not specifically a, a driver of, of how you, you list an ingredient, for example. Um, but just turning to, to, if the question is about OTC um, drugs, um, there are products out there that have CBD as an inactive ingredient. And um, there are also FDA warning letters saying that um, CBD is not a permissible inactive ingredient. So there's going to be risk if you are adding CBD to an OTC drug product and including it as an inactive. Um, it can't be an active uh, ingredient in, in an OTC product. So I'll just mention that because FDA has not permitted such uses. Um, and again, you know, they have their position on, on the use of CBD as an inactive. Um, but if you are going to decide to take that risk and, and, and market an OTC product with, with CBD is, is as an inactive, then you should have testing on file that it is a, um, safe in the amount used in the product, um, that it wouldn't interact with any other ingredients and things like that. So there, there is an obligation of, 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 of safety testing. Um, for OTC products and, and actually for, for any product, like I mentioned, you know, you should still 
um, ensure that the products are, are safe in the amounts that are found in the product, which might include testing. Did anyone else want to chime in there before I get to my final questions? Um, so I guess kind of in, in wrapping this up before we turn it over to Jonathan, I wanted to ask just top line pieces of, of, uh, of advice. We've, we've put out a lot of information here today. So I'd love to hear from each of you on first steps and where you would turn um, to, to, to build the network and to get the support needed. And let's just go ahead and start with you since I have. Okay. Um, you know, I think trade associations are, are always a, a good place to start in terms of resources. And, you know, even if you don't have the money to join one, um, you know, consulting the websites for the U.S. Hemp Roundtable, um, Mario mentioned the U.S. Hemp Authority, um, the American Herbal Products Association. I mean, those are, there are so many, uh, so much free information that that is on there that can at least sort of, you know, get you started in terms of some of the basics and, um, you know, where, and in, in, in areas where, you know, you don't understand, or if you foresee difficulty, or just just don't understand, you know, the requirements. At least you you sort of know what your knowledge gaps are. I think it was mentioned earlier, um, and and so um, you know some some of these associations also have free newsletters um, that you can sign up for, so you can get information on whether it's federal updates or state updates. Um, and I think that's always a good place to start is with those trade associations because they are advocates for their respective industries. Amber, in addition to that, um, although it's not super exciting and it will cure um, any sleepless nights you may possibly be having, the CFRs, the Code of Federal Regulations, are also free. They're online. Um, they are, you're going to look up depending on what kind of product you're making. So if it's a dietary supplement or if it's a food, you can find the Code of Federal Regulations for dietary supplements or foods, so 111 or 117. And reading those will give you a good idea of this good manufacturing process that we all keep talking about um, because it really does list it out. It is a rough read, but if this is really something you are getting into, it's really something you do need to understand. Um, and starting with any free information, like Ren said, um, and Tanya said, and I think also Anthony said, um, is a good place to start understanding what your state has listed what your trade associations have listed, but also what the federal government has listed um, is an important place for you all to start. And so Anthony or Tanya, from the operator perspective, any advice? I would just echo what Rand and Marielle already said. And as I mentioned earlier, just working very closely with the State Department of Agriculture like, to make sure you're informed about what's happening in your state. Um, and as well as tapping into maybe some of the universities that potentially could be doing research around, the, you know, hemp, um, you know, I, other than that, I mean, everybody has already said what I, what the best resources are. So thank you. And then before I turn it over to Jonathan to bring us home, Anthony. You know, it's good to remind ourselves that we're in a period of, you know, the end of prohibition writ large and that's incredibly complicated and messy and none of us really have it completely figured out and so we're just part and parcel so wherever you're located uh, on this call or wherever you're at in the world we're, we're all trying to figure this out together uh, so you're not alone and it is complicated for all of us and secondly collaboration 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 uh, we all need each other it's hard not to compete when you're in business and you're trying to survive and succeed uh, but this industry, I feel, is unique in a lot of ways. And one of those is by virtue of the nature of the plant and the folks uh, who are invested in the industry, uh, the ones that tend to succeed in the long term in, in our experience are the ones that really are invested in sharing information, accessing information, being transparent, um, and being a, a high-level uh, operator um, um, and not always waiting for you know, the next decree to come, but really saying I, it's, I, it's my responsibility to help shepherd the industry and um, embracing that spirit of being a, a sort of a high road um, shepherd of where the industry's headed. 
Thank you, Anthony. Thank you to all of the panelists. And with that, I will turn it over to Jonathan to bring us home to a close. Thanks, Amber, for a great uh, uh, discussion and all, to all the panelists for your, your insight. Uh, it was, uh, I think, very informative on a lot of levels. I know a number of you didn't have a chance to get your questions answered uh, in the time limits, but please send us an email. Send it to info at hempsupporter.com. That's info at hempsupporter.com, and we will do our best to answer uh, any questions that these, uh, this event has, uh, has raised. I do also want to mention, for those of you asking, what, what can I do um, to uh, help uh, promote a, a, a more um, coherent and uh, um, user-friendly uh, process uh, when it comes to getting your, your businesses compliant? And, and that is to come to hempsupporter.com and to have your voice heard on legislation that would uh, help ensure that the FDA provides a clear regulatory path for the sale of CBD as a dietary supplement and food additive. And you uh, hit our federal resources page, type in your name and zip code, uh, emails will populate to your senators and your congressperson to urge them to support this important legislation. And also while you're there, check out what we're doing with our Minority Empowerment Initiative. We're, we're really proud and, and looking forward to your input. So thanks to Amber, thanks to all of our panelists, and mostly thanks to you for joining us. And uh, stay tuned uh, for, for more uh, efforts like this in the coming weeks and months ahead.